We're going to be in ancient Italy, and then we're going to be in contemporary Montclair, so that we can look at these various elements and aspects that really have come out of the Italian heritage and architectural heritage. So, so um, the residents of Montclair, we recognize the Italian contribution to the world in terms of art, literature, and architecture. It's known that many masterpieces of Western civilization were created by the Italians using their innate sense of beauty and design. Today, with the help of my colleague, Frank Valesky, we will see how this sense of Italian style has manifested itself in the architecture of Montclair. Uh, what better place to experience the essence of the Italian villa style than here at the Van Vleck House and Gardens, as you can see up on the screen. Um, it was designed in 1916 by Joseph Van Vleck Jr. for his brother, and his home sits on a 5.2 acre piece of property bought during the 1870s by their father. The parents' home stood at the northwest corner of the property until it was demolished after the death of their mother, and this house was built. And as I sit here, uh, or stand here, and have visited here many times, I'm often amazed or, or, or think about if anyone's been to Pompeii. And this, the way that this is set up is really like a Pompeian um, villa. You have the garden in Pompeii, you would have had a wall across. But we, you would have had this open area with, with um, a water feature. And then the rooms would have opened up and into the um, center area. So you would get the bit of. It could be enclosed, it could be open, but you get that sense of vitality and life, which is very essential to the whole Italian experience. So, um, but here, standing here, Joseph Van Vleck, a partner in the architectural firm of Van Vleck and Goldsmith, was responsible for a number of buildings in Montclair. He, including the current uh, Duran School on Grove Street, formerly the Grove Street School, the Hillside School, Montclair High School, the George, which is a Georgian Inn down the block, the First Methodist Church, and the Madison Building on Bluefield Avenue. Like many American architects, Mr. Van Vleck lived in Montclair while maintaining his office and practice in New York City. Here at the Garden, Joseph applied the architectural principles he learned at Columbia with a first-hand knowledge of original Italian villas he experienced in his travels to the continent. Learning the architectural design and principles through travel to Italy and the rest of Europe was the reward for architects and artists. Similar to the grand tour which 18th and 19th century Europeans embarked upon as the, as the final stage of their education, it provided actual witness to the built environment to experience scale, light, and material. The previous generation relied on books and prints for architectural inspiration, which Frank will go into more detail. But by the turn of the 20th century, American fortunes and the relatively stable political atmosphere encouraged these men to travel, to travel to Europe, to travel to Italy. Charles A. Platt, now, created for create, now credited for creating the concept of the Italian garden, where the house and gardens are parts of a complex spatial composition, employing a, ge a geometry similar to those he experienced in Italy. Along with Edith Wharton, Platt was one of these artist architects who traveled to Italy in 1887. Upon his return, he transformed an existing house in Montclair into an Italian villa, which we will see later. Not this house, but a house on Eagle Rock Way. But for now, let us look at Platt's words as he describes his theory of the relationship of garden to house. The evident harmony of arrangement between the house and surrounding landscape is what first strikes one in an Italian landscape architecture. Platt uses villa, which we consider this to be, in the Italian sense, implying that all formal parts of the grounds are arranged in direct relationship to the house, and the house itself is as much a part of the composition as the garden. But how does one create harmony of a building if the site does not include extensive land on which to create a dialogue between buildings and landscape? To understand that, we need to look at individual architectural features created in Italy, and now we can see in Montclair. Some of these features date back to the Roman period, while others are medieval and then Renaissance. So in order to do that, we have to really look at what the Roman Empire was at, at the time. And it, create, it was really an extensive um, air body all throughout the Mediterranean. Um, they were the first, uh, the Romans were the first in Western civilization to create buildings using a codified co construction system. 
They built buildings that symbolized the power and influence of the Roman Empire and brought this message to the, to the ends of their domain. Between 80 BC and 15 AC, Marco Vitruvio Polio, author, architect, military, and civil engineer, which I find out that most um, Italians have more than one <laughs> career. They have, they have they're the uh, Renaissance men, multi. He was known as Vitruvius, and he wrote his three thesis entitled De Architectura. As Romans had no formalized architectural theory, they looked towards the Greeks for their inspiration. These were the first texts to compare the architecture of the body with that of the building, focusing on three central themes of the building. These themes are force, firmitas, functionality, utilitas, and beauty, venusitas. Many of these theories had, as I said, Greek origins. In his texts, uh, Vitruvius included images and proportions so that it would have been easier for architects to know how a building should look and how it should be worked. Most were large municipal and religious buildings. Many of these are still present today in Europe, Asia, and Africa, all the outposts of the Roman Empire. Um, next slide. Uh, now we come to the Italian Renaissance and the architecture of the great Andrea Palladio. He wrote the four books of architecture. These books contain plans for the construction of villas, churches, and municipal buildings based on the, on the, Roman, ancient, on the Roman style. He practiced in the Veneto, and many of his villas and churches are still witnesses of his creativity. Palladio emphasizes symmetries, perspective, and values of the classical form of architecture as the temple of ancient Rome. And we can see here a plate from his book that um, uh, shows, demonstrates the different styles of columns, many of which we, you'll be able to see on the tour today, and I have some pictures of them later on. So here we see Andrea Palladio and his book and um, the type of detail that he used with uh, floor plans and facades and um, uh, that were his uh, four books. And here are the buildings that he designed and had built and built in the Veneto in Italy. And if we look at these, we can see uh, what's very uh, important is this what's called the temple front with the pediment and the columns. So, it's the one on the upper row. Oh, this is in Venice. That's the Venetian. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So now we're going to fast forward again another few hundred years. And we are going to see buildings in Montclair, the Romanesque style, which is also comes from Italy. During the medieval <coughs> period, the buildings, these buildings were characterized by barrel, barrel walls and semicircular arches. This is called Romanesque. At the end of the century, these arches took on a pointed shape, heralding the Gothic style. And you can see a little bit on the um, doorway, uh, say, uh, over at uh, Mount Carmel Church. Here they are. Here are two buildings: the Church of the uh, Mount Carmel, and notice the arches and the side barrel vaults, which are very medieval. And the other is the original Masonic temple, which is down on South Fullerton, which is now Hair Salon. I think it's Banks. Banks. Yeah, Banks. Yeah. Notice the windows and the stones. These buildings were called the modern inspiration, which we have here in Montclair, of the Romanesque period. So I will now introduce, Frank will introduce himself, and um, he will take over. Time to take it Tante grazie, mi fa molto piacere di essere uh, qui a dare questo talk di Montclair. I'm very pleased to have been invited to give this uh, presentation about the Italian origins of Montclair. Um, I want not to take too long, however. Um, these are engravings, and they're of Eagle Rock. And there was a person from the Crane family named Alexander Jackson Davis. His uh, grandmother was a crane, and uh, he, and also from Bloomfield, from the Joseph Davis family. The Davis farmhouse homestead is now the uh, Bloomfield Steakhouse. But it was a very important property in Bloomfield that went down to the uh, Morris Canal, 
And then there was the green that they donated to the church. They were staunch abolitionists. And uh, Davis was very proud of his relations with Montclair. He was the son of a modest preacher in New York City. And um, so he never really could have a formal education in architecture. He went to work for an engraver. So his whole education in architecture and about Italy is from engravings that he was working on. Oh, and so uh, these were um, actually, this one is commissioned by Llewellyn Haskell. Davis became an architect just through his own training and uh, is known as the father of the uh, American Gothic architecture. But all of his origins are really in having studied the classical architecture of Italy. He and uh, Llewellyn Haskell are responsible for getting the artist community to come to uh, Montclair. He got Haskell to purchase the land that is now Llewellyn Park, where they envisioned doing a, an ideal community of like-minded artists and luminaries and abolitionists and Llewellyn Park that starts on Llewellyn Road in Montclair. And we'll see the, one of the first houses. Um, this is Davis and this is Alexander Jackson Downing, his relative through, uh, they actually met at the White House. Uh, they were both uh, relatives of President Jackson. And um, Downing was a wealthy New York businessman. He owned the monopoly of the ferry boat service on the Hudson River. So his idea was to develop the countryside outside of New York City in two suburbs and have people go back and forth as commuters and they could live in New Jersey in a suburb and have a beautiful property that was different than having a city house but an American house with a garden. So he did two books with Davis about creating American gardens. And one was a pattern book for architecture. We'll see um, if you'd like to move on. Um, Davis took Haskell to Montclair. He originally lived on the uh, ridge along Ridge Road in, in uh, Kearney in a castle designed by Davis. Uh, unfortunately, because the Pacific River was so polluted, his wife and children, unfortunately, died of uh, typhoid and cholera from the water in that area. So uh, Llewellyn Haskell, who was New York City's uh, most wealthy chemicals merchant, whose company then became Merck, uh, wanted to focus on health. So they came out to Montclair, where there was healthy water. And Davis designed this house for him that still exists today on Llewellyn Road. And it's called Bloomfield Villa, because Montclair was called West Bloomfield at that point. And here you see um, how Italian and classical it is. So it was actually Davis who bought the first designs of Italian architecture to Montclair. And this was about 1850. <coughs> um, this house is from the pattern book that Davis drew for uh, Downing about houses, uh, house and gardens that you could possibly do in America. And this was in, to encourage people to move to the suburbs from the cities. So there's um, many of our houses, not many, but there's uh, still a handful left that are originally uh, adapted from the designs of Davis. So this is a Davis design house of an Italian villa. And this is the house today. It's on Upper Mountain Avenue. It was adapted by the architect Norris in 1910. Because it was a pattern book. You would just go through it and choose the house you wanted and the style that you wanted. And then um, in 1900, the architect Norris did this. Next place. So just to show you what else Davis designed, he was considered a very important architect for his understanding of the Italian classicism. So he designed the Stock Exchange Building in New York City, as well as City Hall in New York City. Um, and 
you'll see a direct, I mean, if you remember the slides we saw before of Palladio, there's a very direct connection. Next, please. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> so now what we're going to look at are some examples of, of uh, architectural elements that are in the, the Palladio books that we can actually see here in Montclair today. And I'm sure many of you will recognize the different types of <coughs> columns. Um, we have a Tuscan, which is a plain column with a very simple um, uh, base and a simple top. Out here, right here, we have a door column. And you notice that the same simple top and bottom, but these columns are fluted. So um, that's considered Doric. Uh, I, ionic columns have the little uh, two little sea scrolls up at the top. We have this have them at this house on Upper Mount Avenue and at the Art Museum. And then this is Corinthian columns, and, and they have a, um, a topping a top that has uh, is very floral in, in design. So you can. But these are all in Montclair, the uh, Montclair Art Museum and also First Press Church on Park Street. That's lots of them. One of the major uh, influences that Palladio and what he built, and you saw that in the, in the Palladio slide, were, were his temple facades. And we have many temple facades in Montclair. Uh, the Montclair Art Museum, the Lackawanna train station, Montclair High School, Central Press Church, which we just saw, and banks like to use temple facades, um, as, uh, and this is another church. And the reason being is a temple is a temple for what? A temple for finance, a temple of the arts, a temple um, of religious education, a religious uh, uh, gathering. So the whole idea is in somebody's mind that when you go to the art museum, it really is the temple of the arts, which makes it very much elevated. The Palladium window, um, very common in Montclair. Here we have the George, which is right down the block, um, a, a shot of the um, interior of this window. The Palladium window is a tripart window with columns um, and uh, lintels over here and then a keystone in the center. Many Palladium windows that should go up and down on um, many of the <coughs> residences in one clear. I always get this, the Dio Plesis window. Um, based on the windows that, again, Roman in design, the term, the uh, Caracalla, the Baths of Caracalla, and the Baths of Palmyra, Roman uh, in inspiration, and also apparent here in Montclair at the Lackawanna train station in the Pig and Prince. Um, and a really good shot, if everybody's ever been into the Pig and Prince restaurant itself, you have that idea, that sense, that space of the light coming in that just fills it when the light, when the sun is at a certain um, uh, uh, part of the sky. Um, so this is a very um, unique, uh, although we have it here earlier in the, in the Masonic Temple, but it was a very um, high-end, people didn't understand it that well, very different, hard to maintain, big sheets of glass. Um, so you needed to be able to make these big sheets of glass, which only came, the technology only came apart about, about 1910. Next. What could be more Italian than the Campanella? So um, here we have one, the Church of the Immaculate Conception. This is our Campanelli that you saw from the uh, view from Eagle Rock. And of course, you see them all over Italy as well. An amphitheater. Does everyone know we have an amphitheater in Montclair, at the Montclair High School? Um, I put in the, the uh, amphitheater at Terramina because uh, I do most of my research in Sicily and go back and forth a number of times. Hopefully, I'll be there in two weeks. But um, the, contra the evidence of the Greek and Roman classical ruins is so apparent in Sicily that if no one has ever been and are interested in this, you really should, should go, because all of these examples you'll be able to see there. The loggia, what we have here, the Van Vleck House, the loggia, which is a, um, a covered space 
so that you're able to go outside in all kinds of inclement weather, be able to take in, if it's raining, you can still get your exercise, another Italian feature. And we have the um, examples here from the Vatican, the Loggia of Raphael, and also the Chiesi of the Immaculate Conception, which has that beautiful loggia um, on, on the front of the South Mountain, South Fulton. So a pediment, which is which is um, goes along sometimes, but not all the times, with the typical uh, facade. And the pediment is the triangular shape that it is over the entryway. We can see that Montclair um, in residences in churches and also in bank buildings. Again, to point out the importance of these, this type of institution or resident. And then a portico. Porticos are, um, when you come into the front door and you want uh, not to bring in the weather, you want to be able to take care of your coat, uh, not to have the leaves blow in. Again, another Italian um, classical um, ins inspiration. A number of pediments, including a modern one at the municipal building. We should try to get <laughs> Maybe that we can do a redo. <laughs> but you can see that they're, they are really all over town. Two stories, one story, um, high end. This is the um, women's club down on Union Street. And then the Belvedere. We talked about the, Ita the uh, Italian villa style. This is also the Italianate style, which we have a Belvedere where you're able to go up onto the third floor and be able to look out at, at your surroundings. And how appropriate here in Montclair, where you can be up on, on, the, on the bridge and be able to look over the Meadowlands and into New York City. And the ceramic decoration, as um, our mayor just mentioned, a lot of uh, masons came to settle on Pine Street, uh, came, brought with them building trades. Here we have decorations that are ornament the buildings in town. This is actually on a house, a tile that um, is musicians. Maybe they're telling the uh, people that come, the visitors, to follow the music. Who knows? The uh, Villa di Mini Lucy, a Madonna and Child, a very appropriate decoration for a community house that really focused on the, um, the needs of children and, and, uh, and women. And then the Claridge Theater. We have those Vitruvian ways, which is something that was um, uh, Vitruvius, obviously Vitruvius said, uh, 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 wrote about and described in his uh, work, works. And then also here, this is a very uh, Renaissance motif. And there would be books of, uh, as Frank mentioned, the pattern books that houses were, were made. They would have pattern books that came out during the Renaissance that were distributed, pattern books and prints. And people use these patterns for different things, for uh, embroidery, for, uh, for uh, furniture decoration. If you were going to do something in a room, you, you know, you would use that, as, use that pattern. So this is, is a very classic Renaissance with the central emblem here. And I just wanted to point out that um, the architects that, lived, that worked in Montclair, this is just a sprinkling, I think there's only five. Um, but for the majority, of the, we have architects that worked in Montclair, lived in Montclair, had offices in New York City. Um, and these architects, not a lot has been uh, researched about that, these architects yet. We have Francis August Nelson. I know we have somebody in the audience that lives in a beautiful Nelson house uh, that I promise I will write that, <laughs> that historic designation for. But these men had connections outside of Montclair. For the most part, they were nationally and internationally known. National because they had their offices in New York and international. Otto French, Francis Schmeck, he was the designer of the um, police building. That was the first municipal building in Montclair. They had municipal offices there. He attended the Echo de Beaux Arts in Paris. So when he came back, he brought that inspiration. And this is considered Beaux Arts and style, which is a subcategory of classical architecture, neoclassical. Um, we, we have A.F. Norris. In his obituary, he said that he designed over 400 homes in Montclair, and I think only 270 have been um, uh, uh, known now. William Hull Botsford, 
he designed Lackawanna train station. He was on his trip. I mentioned before that men often went, as in the Grand Tour, went to Europe to um, look and, and actually be in a space, to see the materials, to see how they were built, to notice the light. Um, he never made it back. He was on his trip to uh, the, um, Italy, and unfortunately for him, he got a second class ticket on the Titanic. So he, was, he went down on the Titanic. So he never saw this finished, but he was a very young man, and he was the um, worked for the Erie Lackawanna as a uh, uh, designer of train stations. And if he had survived, he probably would have had a, a really great career. I think he died when he was 24. He was very, very young. But he went to Cornell. So you know, you've got these highly educated men, and yes, they are all men, but you have these highly educated men that are using their, um, you know, their education to come back and to put something back into the community. Frank Wallace, people might recognize this house. This is 25 Highland Avenue. Also classical in design with the portico and the pediment. Um, he wrote a book called ABC of Architecture. I think this came out, one came out in 1911 and one in 1913. So he also lived in Montclair. And this was a type of book, it was small, probably just double the width of this. But this would be something that people would be looking at to actually see what was considered classical in style, because that was the big style. In Montclair, we, have to, we also have the English um, Tudor style, which is very, uh, you know, enormous. We have a large inventory of that, but it would be which you can see right here. But we have the 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 difference between the Tudor style and the classical style, which is such an eclecticism that it really makes Montclair very very unique. And then Francis August Nelson, he went to Columbia. He won a McKee scholarship to go to um, Italy and Europe, and he stayed in, in Italy for three years and came back. And his buildings, you might recognize, this is the, upper, the Bellevue Library branch, the Upper Montclair Women's Club, the Anchorage on Park and Wildwood, and then what was the um, uh, post office in Upper Montclair. So we have these architects that invested their time, they invest their lives were here in the community, their children went to the schools here, and yet their offices were in New York. So there was a huge um, you know, flow back and forth of, of technique and styles and inspiration. So these are still, yet yeah, many still need to be researched and hopefully we're gonna be working on that soon. So Frank is gonna wrap it up. Thank you. I just want to say that Dr. Lillian Gilbreth, who is one of the most important designers, she wasn't an architect, she was a scientist. Uh, she was the mother of the cheaper by the dozen family, but she designed what is considered the triangle of the kitchen island. She was a time motion expert for the Industrial Revolution and uh, designed the first handicap accessible apartment for the 1939 World's Fair and is also responsible for many patents, including the pedal-operated rubbish pail. So we do have women designers that are very important, and I just wanted to mention that. Um, this house is very interesting. It's one of the original houses in um, Llewellyn Park that began on Llewellyn Road. Llewellyn Haskell's house was down the street, Bloomfield Villa, and this was an Italian sort of country estate sort of architecture, very Tuscan, and it was the house that was never completed. It was owned by uh, relatives of the original uh, board members of Llewellyn Park, uh, the Howe family. They're related to the house of the freed slave house. They were of mixed race, and um, the Howe family, uh, well, uh, the house, the freed slave house was James' house. He was a former slave. His uh, descendants became farm real estate developers with the Crane family and are, in my opinion, responsible for a lot of immigrants, African-American immigrants coming up from the South to uh, find work and to own properties and businesses in Montclair. 
So this house was owned by the Howe family for a while before Pratt bought it, and the son of Joseph Howe, uh, who owned this house, was one of the compon components of the um, Montclair artist community that was founded by Innes. Now, George Innes came to Montclair. Uh, everyone thinks of him as this artist who, and his son, and they, they were very beau mignon and, and, you know, sat around campfires and did sketches. Well, they were fabulously wealthy and gave fabulous uh, 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 fox hunts at their estate, uh, Rosewell Hall, which is now the campus of uh, Mountainside Hospital. But anyway, Pratt bought this. It was written about uh, in one of our history books as a house being that was very creative. The inside of the house looks very, very much like uh, uh, a, a, an Italian engraving with uh, two-story spaces and columns. It's, it's quite amazing. So then it was purchased by Pratt. Uh, who is one of the foremost designers of um, country states in Long Island. Okay. This is uh, by Norris, and it's a perfect Italian Renaissance palace, that, uh, Venetian palace that you could take from the Grand Canal, you know, and it just comes right to Montclair. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's fascinating. A lot of these houses that you're going to see uh, were built that were built on the hill uh, were built there because it was a status symbol of the time to watch the dawning of the new world and that was the building of the skyscrapers in New York and as I said before there was Innes uh, Frederick Law Olmsted loved George Innes's work and his idea was to take an Innes painting and place it in the middle of New York City as Central Park and that's what it is it's like a naturalistic uh, landscape place in the middle of the city that develops around it. So um, it was then uh, Olmsted students at Harvard, like uh, John Nolan, who did the Nolan plan, the first uh, urbanistic plan for Montclair, that said that Montclair should have English architecture, because it looked like a hamlet, a hillside hamlet in England. This is the Ferry House by Norris as well. This is it today. It's on Afterglow Way. Afterglow Way was an amazing place. We called it the Yellow Brick Road because there was a road that is still made out of bricks, vitrified bricks, and that's because to get to it was quite impossible when these houses were built and all of the cars, because there was no fuel injection in cars, all the fuel would spill out on the road. <laughs> so uh, there were roads in Montclair that were built with this kind of system. This is the house across the street, Philadelphia. Uh, Kathleen and I still don't know why it was called that because you would maybe call it Villa, Villa de Dera, Villa, de Dera, <laughs> the Villa of Ivy, but I guess they just made up the name. This is the uh, former Strayhan house. It was called Daybreak. It was built on Lloyd Road, and the Deer family that built it were having problems because nobody wanted to visit them, so they had another house built that was identical down on South Mountain because you could get to it by car. <laughs> this is um, like an Italian Tuscan palace. It's by uh, Mayer, and it was his response. He did it for um, the uh, Gates, uh, Frederick Gates, who was the head of uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and the Rockefellers, who commissioned him uh, as their CFO, CEO, uh, thought that it might be nice to have libraries like the Carnegie's, so you know they were sort of competing the Rockefellers with her. So the house was going to be left to the public as a library, but then when Gates died, the town didn't want it. And uh, they said it was too big and fancy. It was designed by Van Vleck in the interior with Louis Comfort Tiffany. And so this became the house of Sweet Daddy Grace, the African-American minister who bought it in 1940 <coughs> and owned it until when I was going to Montclair Academy. And the people in the neighborhood would call it uh, Father Divine's house because he was an African American. But, but anyway, um, this is Minnie Lucy, and she was a missionary uh, hired by the American government to educate uh, Italian American immigrants who were arriving in Montclair. 
in the 1890s, and she was uh, to educate them in, uh, and Donato Di Geronimo has uh, done an extensive history of this, and in his family history, this was a center where his family who uh, immigrated from Italy would go to, to learn how to take care of their children. Um, and this is in the Pine Street area. The Pine Street area um, was built by Italian immigrants and they took their expertise from Italy to Montclair. Uh, those are terracotta uh, ornaments. Uh, these are modern buildings uh, compared to Italian buildings because they have uh, brick construction with the water with the cornice that waterproofs the lintels of the windows. This is uh, a church on Pine Street that um, um, Our Lady of Mount um, Carmel. Carmel. Um, and these are uh, ah, Hotel Montclair that was on top of the mountain was in the Italian style. And uh, it's now the site of the Rockcliffe Apartments, but this was a five star hotel and a lot of people from New York City would come out and uh, enjoy the views of Manhattan. The Hink building is of the same architecture. Um, but the whole idea, uh, this is the casino of uh, the High Long Pavilion. Uh, we're going to visit it on the bus now. And the idea was that Montclair was like a it was like a beacon. It was like something seen from the distance from New York, like a beacon on top of the mountain. So uh, Monte Chiara is very appropriate. And uh, you know, you would come here, and you would go to the top of the mountain, and you'd look down and see the village of Montclair and the Campanile. So it was sort of like Fiesole at that time. And that's it. <laughs> Se bisogna essere